Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the Aqueduct interview series on LLMs and foundation models. My name is Vikram Srikanti, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Aqueduct, um, and I have Joey Gonzalez here with me again. Joey, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Hi, I'm Joey Gonzalez. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm a faculty at UC Berkeley, a co-founder at Aqueduct. Um, I've been doing research in machine learning systems for over, over a decade now. Um, I started working on projects like Graph Lab, you know, thinking about large-scale graph processing systems. I worked on parts of Apache Spark, launched a company along the way called Turi to you know, help data scientists scale data science. Um, and then maybe for the past eight or so years, I've been thinking a lot about you know, prediction serving technology, how it works in the cloud. Um, building new new computer vision, natural language processing models. Uh, and then, of course, as we all do recently, thinking a lot more about large language models and their implications on machine learning and machine learning systems. So in the first conversation on, on uh, LLMs, we, we kind of talked about the implications of large language models in particular, how they work, what they're actually doing. But actually, the LLMs are part of a larger class of models I think more commonly referred to as foundation models recently. So what is a foundation model? <laughs> Good question. Uh, well, the short answer might have been uh, foundation model is kind of a, a, a new marketing term for the models we've been building. Um, I think a better answer, like thinking more deeply of where foundation models uh, are going, kind of where they came from, is this idea that you know we can build models for many tasks, build a, a core model for, for many different uh, machine learning tasks. And in doing that, that model uh, embodies a broader set of, let's say, foundational knowledge. Um, and in some cases, we'll actually be better at many of the downstream tasks because of that knowledge. Um, in some kind of funny sense, uh, models like ResNet that were trained on the ImageNet computer vision corpus became the foundation for a lot of work in computer vision, this kind of pre-training to learn textures, uh, you know, most of my grad students when developing computer vision techniques would start with one of those models. More recently, foundation models has uh, come to mean things like uh, CLIP or these large language models that really try to represent a broad set of, of computer vision or natural language reasoning tasks. Um, if we take CLIP, for example, as a popular model in computer vision, um, it's trained with text and with image data, which means that you can take CLIP and say, um, I want to build a classifier of you know, empty trash cans. Uh, and by describing what it is, the caption of the image that you're looking for, we automatically can generate a classifier from that caption without any new training data. Um, and so this kind of more general visual reasoning uh, is something that, that CLIP uh, presents, the, these you know, essential computer vision foundation models. Likewise, if we look at, at natural language reasoning, uh, it used to be we would train models for you know, translation from one language to another specific language. And then we started thinking about translation from one language to many languages. Uh, we'd think about question answering for specific domains. And I started thinking more general question answering. And we look at LLMs today, we have a single model that can do question answering, uh, translation, uh, coding, all sorts of tasks. And so it's it's moving more in the direction of general understanding in the design of our models, the ability to handle many different tasks at once, um, which has this neat effect that these models actually become pretty good at, at some of these tasks as well. Um, we still take these models, and in some cases, we can do what's in context learning, uh, where we actually just take the model as is and, and you know, solve new problems by you know, modifying prompts, changing the way we, we call the, the computer vision, the computer vision model. Um, or we take things like fine tuning. We, we take these models, we adjust them with additional training to a new domain, uh, to more specialize them to specific tasks that may not have been you know, the, the expertise that was developed in its more general uh, learning. So how should I think about that phrase? Is, is foundation modeling you know, a, a technique like deep learning? Is it a trend just in, in the architecture of these models that, hey, we're gonna go build larger models that are much more general? Is it something else altogether? Like what, 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 are, what is the phrase foundation model actually referring to? So uh, I think it's more the broader trend. Um, it is the idea, it, Found it, it's the idea that I can build a model that, that can uh, represent a large set of tasks uh, that can embody a, a broader set of knowledge. Uh, it's typically done today with, with large uh, models. These are typically deep neural networks. Um, I guess you could imagine foundation models built on uh, kind of nearest neighbor methods. And you know, some might imagine that some of the, the, the networks we're building embody some kind of uh, notion of nearest neighbor method, you know, pulling from the data that they've seen to, to generate the, you know, the predictions they need to, to, to make. Um, 
yeah, it may, it's it's harder to find, and it's an ongoing debate. In different academic groups view these, uh, you know, foundation models. Is it marketing? Is it a, a more uh, more fundamental trend in model design? I, I like to think it was this movement towards more general uh, understanding the design of our models, rather than building models for very specific tasks. We build models for more general reasoning, and uh, and ideally, those those models with more general reasoning capabilities, in some sense, become better at the individual tasks. So how generalizable is this trend really beyond GPT and LLMs? We've seen you know, OpenAI release Dolly uh, about a year ago. Google released something similar last summer, uh, or at least internally announced it. And then uh, you know some of your students built a model called Genmo um, a few months back that's more focused on video generation, I believe. So beyond just the text models, we've seen this start to move into uh, other types of um, you know, other domains as well. How should we think about how far this trend goes? So, yeah. So, how general do we think this trend is? Uh, you know, we've it's certainly in language reasoning. Uh, it's it's taken over the world, um, and so these generative uh, pre-trained models that are you know uh, the foundation of, of what we do in uh, language reasoning today. Um, in many ways, without additional fine tuning, you know, doing this kind of in-context learning, if it's become standard. Um, in computer vision, uh, if we look at basic image reasoning, so these kind of clip models have taken over and become um, widely successful. Uh, for video reasoning, the, the work my students have been work, exploring has been more piecemeal. There isn't a generative model yet that kind of broadly spans the space of video, uh, video, audio, movies. Um, there's opportunities there. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know of any kind of foundation model work in that space. So uh, I do think as an academic community, it's it's pretty exciting. You know, our, you know, for 50 years now, I guess the kind of longer term vision of AI is more than 50 years has been really towards understanding kind of general intelligence and building, you know, systems that can, mod it can, it can model or, you know, embody the kind of human level reasoning, uh, human level knowledge, and, and maybe even go beyond that. Um, so I have to imagine that we'll see more of this uh, and the kind of early evidence of the capabilities of these techniques uh, in the past five years has been really impressive. Um, you know, when I look at the broader decades of history in, in AI, it's, uh, it's always been slowed down by lack of compute capabilities initially, then lack of data, um, lack of, of modeling techniques, the right algorithms, and all those things are kind of coming together now. Uh, and having those means that we can go after kind of bigger missions of you know, general capabilities for these models. And, and it is, you know, as we're already seeing, uh, that, that unlocks pretty new, new uh, opportunities. So where all have we seen this be applied so far? Are there, you know, beyond, we, we talked about text, we talked about images and video. Um, are there other applications that you're excited about that we should be keeping an eye out on? So one thing I'm excited about, especially in my research group, is this idea that we can start to compose these models to build even more cool things. Uh, so the idea that you know I can use something like a large language model uh, to break down a content creation task into smaller content creation tasks that I could then feed out to uh, other language models, other computer vision generative models. Um, I, in fact, I, I, I should... The whole stable diffusion, this whole idea of, of you know image generation from noise, uh, another space where we've embodied you know human visual knowledge at least in the, at the image domain um, into to our models, uh, being able to stitch these these generative models together to to accomplish bigger tasks than any one model could could do, I think is super exciting, um, and and it's sort of like you know how humans work together as a team. You know you have one expert that can kind of direct many different experts to solve a problem. Um, building technologies, models that, are, that can work in teams to solve problems is something that's you know, pretty cool. Uh, and you know, again, looking at kind of video generation, that's sort of what you need, or at least what you need today uh, if you want to do that. You break the problem into smaller steps, having models working for each of the you know, individual steps to help create content. Um, I have you know, some of the students, uh, in fact, not my students, but other students at Berkeley have been looking at kind of 3D generation, um, so, you know, how does the three-dimensional world, uh, three-dimensional content uh, automatically get created by models? Um, so a lot of, I guess a lot of smaller pieces uh, that take some, some element of this general visual understanding or general language understanding and compose it to do new things. Um, I think it's pretty exciting. Yeah. That, and so as we think about how more and more of these models, especially these kind of more domain specific models get, get built, um, Intuitively, you know, I think we, we think of these as 
OpenAI, Stability AI, these big companies, lots of money behind them, spending $10 billion of Microsoft money on, on GPUs, whatever it is. But also now you're talking about your students, other students at Berkeley building some of these, these models. What, what actually goes into building a foundation model? Can, you know, quote unquote, just anyone build one? Or how, how does this process actually look like? Yeah, for the most part, it remains largely out of reach for research groups. Uh, these tend to be pretty big training runs done at uh, industrial organizations. Um, w when we take something like um, reasoning about three-dimensional objects and you say, you know, I want a, a picture of a cat dancing uh, or, you know, a video of a cat dancing or a three-dimensional model of a cat dancing. Um, the way, you know, students at Berkeley would approach this problem is you can take things like stable diffusion, take models that others have published uh, that are good at one task, like, you know, what would it look like from one camera's perspective? Or what would it look like from another's if I had seen, you know, the, the first camera's perspective? Um, so this, you know, two-dimensional reasoning, we can then lift into a three-dimensional setting. Uh, what we don't see is the students typically training those base models. We find them fine-tuning the base models or composing them in interesting ways. Um, unfortunately, uh, building these base models remains pretty uh, capital intensive. There's uh, startups together are starting to look at kind of how to decentralize this process, um, but I think it's still pretty early. Uh, there's uh, you know, open efforts in other countries, uh, Bloom to build uh, these kind of, you know, the big science effort to, to build models that would be you know, open language models, but you know, they haven't quite been as competitive. Um, the best efforts we've seen uh, that are you know, marginally open, something like the, the LAMA effort, the GPT, or the, sorry, OPT effort at, at Meta, um, those are, you know, those are pretty good models. Uh, and in fact, there's some great videos. Uh, I think the Stanford group interviewed the, the OPT team that walked through kind of the, the craziness behind training those models and how they're like trace, chasing a training curve and, you know, it, something goes wrong, they have to go fix machines, change the training algorithm. You know, the, the expense behind all of this is, is pretty in, insane. Um, so right now, uh, academic groups uh, aren't, aren't in general training their own foundation models. Uh, I'm trying to think, like Bloomberg, some have actually made efforts at training kind of more specialized foundation models to their domain, um, which which makes sense. Though the you know the fundamental idea of foundation models is how this you know broader set of domains will make a stronger model, um, and so really having lots and lots of data from many different domains and and the compute capabilities to run all that data is pretty critical. Um, and and sadly, right now that is not really within access, at least for my research group. Got it. So maybe the place to end then is how much of the uh, innovation that's going to happen in the next, let's call it six months or a year, do you think is going to come from fine tuning versus from, you know, step changes like the change between GPT-3 and GPT-4 and the base model? That's a great question. Uh, I think... I expect a lot of work around fine tuning, um, largely because some of these base, not as good open or pseudo open models like uh, research only models uh, will, will allow researchers that don't have access to massive training to do creative stuff with those models to open up interesting new, new capabilities. Um, so I expect to see a lot of that. Uh, the other thing I, I will see for these big models is when you know when we can't train them, we can try to use them. Uh, and so grad students are already finding ways to make fun calls to OpenAI's tools to do new kinds of things. So this kind of in context composition, even you know maybe fine tuning through you know open a, uh, open uh, APIs to the the fine tuning process of these big models. Um, I think we'll see that. I, yeah, I, I don't. I hope to be surprised, but I don't imagine really big training runs opening up uh, whole new capabilities in the next year. So, okay. Well, I think we can call it there. We have a whole conversation planned on fine tuning uh, yep. where we can dive into how this stuff works some more. But uh, I think that's it for today. Awesome. Thanks for having me.